Live from the Mecca Mormonism, this is Heart of the Matter, where we do all we can to help people walk toward his love. And uh, I'm your host, Sean McCraney. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we seek you in spirit and truth, and we pray that you'll be with us, uh, help those who are seeking to be free in you, that they will, you will uh, send your spirit to guide them and help me as I deliver the message. Help Seth and Wendy and Kathy Mags and uh, the viewers, and we just pray that you'll be with us and um, walk in the shoes that you want us to walk in. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to kick tonight off by saying something I really believe with all my heart. I hope you'll take it uh, with the same seriousness which I give it. I hope you'll test the crud out of it uh, if you're so inclined uh, because it's that important. Um, the apostolic record, which has erroneously been called the New Testament by men, uh, describes the church and a people living at that time in a very strict legalistic culture imposed upon them by the apostles. Can't get around this. If you read that New Testament and you don't see it, you have a bad case of uh, you're myopic or you, uh, you have prejudice. You're just blinded to what it says. The apostles were very, very clear, so was Jesus, that there were expectations uh, on the actual genuine lives of people that they were to be holy in that day. They really, truly were. I wouldn't say this, you know, I, I, like many of you study scripture, so do I, and it's just so present in the epistles. So we're teaching through uh, Ephesians in our campus uh, studies, and in chapter four and five, Paul lays out some expectations, and I, I, I'm in that studying for campus, and so I just want to present it to you. Let me give you a quick summary of the things he says at the end of chapter four to the beginning of chapter five. He says, put on a new nature created after the likeness of God, after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now we say God is holy and that he's righteous. He says to put on a nature that is created in the likeness of God. He says, put away falsehood and speak truth to your neighbor. Everyone speak truth. If you get angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give any opportunity for the devil. Let no anyone who used to be a thief steal no longer. And then he says, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands so that he may be able to give to those in need. So uh, how's that for biblical literalists? Are, are all Christians out there working with their own hands? Because that's what he says if you're a biblical literalist. He says, let no evil talk come out of your mouths. No evil talk. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice go. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Now, most of what I just read to you is pretty reasonable and applicable to Christians today, except maybe the doing the work with your own hands bit. But most of it, you know, we can see how it has application to us. And then in chapter 5, Paul continues. You know, he is throw, he's throwing this stuff on them. He says, therefore, be imitators of God. That, that means mimic God as his beloved children. Be mimickers of God and walk in love as Christ loved us. But fornication and all impurity and covetousness must not be named among you. So no fornication, no impurity, no covetousness, no idolatry can be named among you. Let there be no filthiness, no silly talk, no silly talk, no levity, but let there be thanksgiving. And be sure of this, he says, that no fornicator or impure man or one who is covetousness, that's an idolater, who has an inherit will have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. He says that. Therefore, do not associate with them who are that way. Walk as children of light. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. It's a shame to even speak 
of what the idolaters do in private. And then he continues at verse 15 and he throws down another list. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. Do not get drunk with wine. He didn't say vodka, but he said wine. If you're a biblical literalist, no drunkenness with wine. But he says, don't get drunk is really what he's saying. For that is debauchery, he says. Now, Orthodox Greeks, you guys say you guys have the the original right there. Paul says, don't get drunk with wine. You guys are drunk every weekend. Well, a lot of you. But be filled with the Spirit. Address one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody with the Lord in your heart, always in everything giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. So that's just one half of two different chapters. So one full chapter. Throwing down, and that's just a very small part of what is put upon Christians in that day. So those words plus a thousand others in the letters of the apostles in the church and that they paint a very clear picture to the believers then who were in that time. Conform completely to the spirit or you will not be part. You will not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Now, listen, even Jesus speaking to the seven churches in Asia Minor through John the Beloved in the book of Revelation. Jesus comes forward in chapter two and three, and there's seven actual churches with real members, real members, real believers in those churches that John writes this revelation to. It's written to them, and he's supposed to take this revelation and give it to them, and they're going to read it in that day, right? And listen to what Jesus says to these different churches. At the church at Ephesus, whom he compliments greatly for their labors, he also says, Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and will remove the candlestick that uh, out of his place, except you repent. That's a straight up challenge by Jesus after he compliments them. Change and repent or I'm going to remove the candlestick from out of its place. I'm not going to go into explain what that means to the church at Pergamos. Jesus said from heaven, I have a few things against you. You have some who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice immorality. You have also have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So it's a direct threat from Jesus. Change this about yourself or I'm going to come and make war with you with the sword of my mouth. To the church at Thyatira, which is a real church, after complimenting them, he says, I know your works, your charity, your service, your faith, your patience, your works, the last be more than the first. That sounds really good, doesn't it? He always gives them the compliments first. Notwithstanding, Jesus says, I have a few things against you because you suffered that woman Jezebel which calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. He says all, he goes on, he warns about this Jezebel, Jezebel, and he says, I will give unto every one of you according to your works. That is so heavy handed. Jesus is giving to his bride or the church, however you want to see it at that time. Listen, and then quickly at Sardis, he says, uh, be watchful, strengthen those who that remain who are ready to die I have not found your works perfect before God. The implication of that is Jesus is saying, I want to find your works perfect before God. That is legalism. That's heavy. That is a weight. That's religion. That, I mean, and Jesus is saying it to the church at Sardis there in Revelation 3. And then he says, uh, even to the actual literal believers that filled the, the church at Philadelphia, uh, he, he, who doesn't have anything negative to say to them, he says, behold, I come quickly. I am coming to you quickly. Hold fast which you have that, that no man can take your crown. So he's saying someone can take the crown you have. This once saved, always saved BS, baloney. He said that Jesus says to the believers in Philadelphia, I'm coming quickly to them. Then hold fast to your crown. 
But again, to them, it was a heavy, heavy uh, weight. And then finally to the church at Laodicea, he says most soberly to them, because you're lukewarm, you're not cold, you're not hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I'm increased with goods, I have need of nothing. Don't you know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? He throws down. So, that's Jesus there. Go to 2 Corinthians, Paul in 7.1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. To, uh, and chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians ends with Paul saying, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Ready? To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. So he says, listen, At the coming of the Lord, you need to be unblameable in holiness before God. That was 2,000 years ago to real believers then. The apostles were writing. Jesus was speaking on and on. Why all of this? And I've omitted hundreds of passages uh, that are just as powerful about the behaviors and attitudes and lives of the Christians in that day. Here's why I just did that. Because if Jesus didn't come back and take his pure, righteous, holy bride, then he's still coming back to take her. If he didn't come back to take that that little group that had the weight of holiness upon them under the apostles' direction, then he's still coming back to take her. And that means that the church in the world needs to radically change what it looks like. Let me say this another way. If I'm wrong about my end time eschatology and Jesus is coming back in the future to take his bride as she has been instructed uh, that he would do in in the apostolic record, I am the most deadly teacher of scripture on earth. You should run from what I teach because He is coming back to take a pure, holy, unspotted, blameless bride from the earth who are his believers. And I teach he already came and took her. And therefore, I don't emphasize these things the way Paul and Jesus did in that day to them. I emphasize something completely different in a different way that's in Scripture. But it's as if he already came. So if he didn't come back, truly turn the channel and run from me, because like like the attackers and, and people who have done some things say, you know, the guy is is wrong. He's bad. He's the Antichrist, whatever. So you got to believe that if he hasn't come back, you got to figure that out. Frankly, um, run from any teacher who teaches grace alone, who teaches hyper grace, find a church or a pastor that preaches and teaches holiness, righteousness, who uh, complicity to everything that the apostles wrote in the New Testament. True complicity to that. And when I think of people like that, I think of super orthodox. I think of Amish people. I think of uh, people of that ilk. We're talking, they walk in holiness. They speak in low tones. They have complete con- uh, control over their body and humor. There's no laughter. There's no levity. They follow the apostolic record. And um, let me put it to you another way. If I was not convinced that Jesus had come back and taken his pure bride, um, I would be a very different pastor right now. I would have a church that would demand righteous living of the people who attended. I would have disciplinary uh, action taken against people who were found to be liars, who laughed too much, who, who drank and got drunk. I would be that kind of pastor over that flock because that is the way the apostles describe the church to be in that day and what many people believe to be in our day too because Jesus hasn't come back and taken his bride. 
My point is you can't play half-ass. This is part of my danger. That was levity, wasn't it? With the faith. You can't take some of the word and say, well, that's important, that's important, that's important. And take some of it and say, that's not important, that's not important. You can't do it. It's got to be we are either, either in an age that has been completed, he's taken his bride, and we live in a completely different way, or we live in the age that is described in the New Testament, and we should still be doing what the apostles said we should be doing. Put it another way, if I'm wrong, then Jason Wallace, and my hat's off to him, and his approach, from what I can tell, is right. He's a holy man. He, he speaks in soft tones. He doesn't say half-assed on his show. Uh, uh, where Jason is really off, in my estimation, is his, is his chronology and his application. But he's not off on what the New Testament demands. I mean, he is calling it for what he sees. He's an Orthodox Presbyterian, and he sees what it says. So he's not off in that, you guys. He's just off in terms of, is it still applicable or not? If Jason's right, or people like Jason's right, is right, are right, I am really, really off. And I say that to you because you gotta find out if you, if you see it that way. Because you don't wanna play this lukewarm thing that Jesus was complaining about. You wanna be hot or cold. You wanna be for it, or you wanna be out of it. And I'm saying we're in a different age. I'm saying Jesus came back. In fact, I just want to explain something in a new way to you by going to the board. And so let me, uh, let me try to get over there and do this while I drag the microphone across the floor. I would have been excommunicated for that in the early church. Just kidding. I just want to show you just kind of a little... Uh, it's just a little simple way to understand the periods and times. There was one man, Adam, that God related to, right? Adam failed. Adam was an individual, okay? There was one nation, the Jews, the house of Israel. The house of Israel failed. That's two fails in a row, right? And they were corporate. It was a body of, of uh, people that God was working with. There was one savior and he tips the scales. He succeeded. He was an individual. So we see individual. We see an alternating thing going on here with God working through people. We have one Adam, he failed. We have one nation failed. We have one savior, he succeeded. And, and then we have individual, corporate individual. We have another one bride. That bride in the New Testament day succeeded. This was the second succession. So we have two fails and we have two successes. Two fails, one man, one nation, one savior, one bride. This was the Jesus from his own people. So we have one man, we have the second Adam here in Jesus. That's what Paul calls him. So this one Adam from him becomes the nation of Israel. Both of those are fails. From one savior comes his bride. Both of those are successes. And from the one savior and the one bride, we have, again, jumping here, corporate. This is a body of people, right? And after that was done and set up by God, we have the fail, fail, succeed, succeed, one person, one nation, one savior, one bride, individual, corporate, individual, corporate. We go back to individual, one believer, you, me, whoever, going all the way back to the beginning now, all done because of Christ, one believer now, that's you. That's me, whoever we are. And it's success all the way. And it's individually based. The faith is subjective. We are not under the rule of this. And just like we're not under the rule of that. God has had success in and through this approach to the world to redeem it and bring all people to him. So I don't believe that, that uh, we're waiting for him to come. I don't, oops. 
I don't believe that all this is going to happen in the future. I believe it happened to them. That bride was special. And those apostles who were on earth with them was, was telling them how to live and how to be. And we have to take that seriously. So I just wanted to cover that with you because um, it's important stuff when it comes to how to do church. And I really mean that, that if I'm wrong on this, then what I'm teaching is something antithetical to what all the rest of the churches are teaching, which is he's coming back. Uh, you got to be ready. And if that's right, then that whole act needs to be cleaned up. If God comes to me tonight, he's not going to do that. But if he came to me tonight and said, Sean, you're wrong. I'm coming back. The word is true. The apostles were right in what they wrote. Read the New Testament and follow it. I would show up Sunday and you would see such a different man and such a different approach to the faith. And like I said, I would be doing something that I don't think is being done now, except by maybe some certain uh, Amish or something like that. So I hope that makes sense. Last night, we illustrated information on the Holy Spirit and the LDS Church on the whiteboard, and we have some great comments from that. I want to open up the phone lines, 801-590-8413, 801-590-8413. Sarah offline says, please ask Sean, so even with your strong aversion to legalism, if you haven't stumbled upon preterism and come to believe that Christ already came in 70, what? If you hadn't stumbled upon preterism and come to believe that Christ already came in 70 AD, you would have, would, what? What? Oh, uh, at this point in my life, I would follow in the, what I just described. I would, uh, now what I can see from scripture, I would be embracing the New Testament word for word, and I would be trying to live what the apostles said. Exactly. And I would not uh, endorse laughter. <laughs> I would uh, not endorse jesting. I would not, uh, I would not in, uh, allow people to drink in our uh, group. I would be preparing our small group for the second coming of Christ as the apostles were preparing the small house churches for his second coming then. And it would be a very legalistic, uh, prayer-based, holy living, righteous living approach to the faith. Because you can't get away from those instructions, even though all the conversations about grace and everything else are there uh, too. So uh, from R. De Silva, wow, thanks for that explanation. Last night we did a board explanation to show how the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And some great comments from that. MH says, this is really a clear teaching. What brings a believer to turn from some wrong direction they may have headed in if the Holy Spirit leaves the minute that believer commits an infraction to the code? I think it's the Holy Spirit within believers that reminds them about God or the Word and that pulls them to a stop before making a choice or to change course or to choose another way over another. He's there until you blaspheme Him or kick Him out, basically. Sure, it grieves the Holy Spirit if you're oblivious to Him, but I don't think God quits on people. Some people, it takes letting them run until they hit rock bottom before they'll turn back to him. But I think he's going to try to help you to avoid wrong choices and toward the ways that are best for you from an eternal standpoint, as long as there's a chance that you'll listen, not leave you. And if you feed on the word, you give him an amplifier. Pros complete, he says. And I agree with that. I'm going to comment on that in a minute. But what good is the Holy Spirit if he abandons you when you need him most? I mean, really, what good is Jesus and his sacrifice and the Holy Spirit and God's love for us if every time we start to get into trouble, they walk? That, that makes no damn sense at all. I mean, as parents, you really step up as a parent when your kids are in trouble. Anybody can go to the awards ceremonies and anybody can go watch their kids graduate. It's when the kids are truant and getting thrown in jail that you step up as a parent. And if we do that as parents, what the heck is God doing with the Holy Spirit leaving us the moment you become unworthy? 
That's the BS about the LDS uh, thing, and it keeps people in bondage. It's complete BS, and we're going to have a comment from someone I like who's LDS in a minute. Uh, three Itty Bitty Picky Story says, uh, when you're on the hamster wheel of death, you're not with Jesus. Walk toward my love. Love that. Uh, all the way from uh, England, Moira writes, first of all, I feel really confused. Moira is LDS. Maybe it's just me, but I got baptized. I received what we call the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands to the holy priesthood. Regardless of that ordinance and teaching, I have always felt I've had the Holy Spirit with me. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what my Savior has done on my behalf. In my darkest hours, I have felt his influence and presence with me, but I believe this is more because of their tender mercies upon me rather than anything else. The Holy Ghost is a true companion of spirit. He is my friend, my teacher, comforter, the spirit of truth. I appreciate him so much and the role he plays under the direction of Father in Christ. Thank you, Sean. Program so valuable, especially for those searching for truth. As a member of the church, I find your teachings enlightened. That enables me to search further into my own uh, beliefs and heart. What I believe is a good thing. Thank you, Sean. Moira, thank you for watching and, and not uh, hating me yet, Moira. Uh, we're just trying to talk about the truth. I've been in your uh, shoes and we try to speak frankly, but in love. Uh, and again, got to emphasize, if someone wants to be LDS, they can be as good of a Christian as I can be non-LDS. It's not the denomination. It's your heart for God, your faith, your walk with Him in love. That has to be emphasized. Okay, Scott Wyman says, good news indeed. Thank you, Sean. Don Zimmer says, an excellent, clear understanding of the Holy Spirit taking up residence in us. That was the whole message of last night's program. Jump Rope Stairs says, can there be the Holy Spirit if there's more than one God. It's a really great point. If the LDS believe in a, an eternal regression of gods, then how could there be the Holy Ghost? It would have to, shouldn't it be a Holy Ghost? And a Holy Ghost shall come upon you because if there's many gods and many Christ, then there probably should be many Holy Spirits too. So I thought that was interesting. C. Whitener says, love the show. I tell people that God lives in me. You don't hear that. Uh, and we're going to read in a minute. The scripture says, Christ lives in me. That's something you'll never hear the LDS say. But Christ lives in us, according to scripture. But he says, he created me for the purpose of relationship. That means God. Through the baptism of the Spirit, I've been restored, remade, and given new life, born again. Through the Jesus lens, God sees me as holy and made in his image. It's not what I have done. It's what's done for me. I love the following passages of the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. Titus 3, 4 through 7, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He genuinely, generous, generously poured out his Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. He cites three fantastic scriptures there. Love them all. Stephanie Smith says, I love the simplicity of the uh, presentation. You should watch it. It was last night's show. It was on the board. And it talks about how and why, using the scripture as the context, the Holy Spirit lives in us and not with us. And that the Holy Spirit doesn't depart from us when we have moments of sinfulness or, or doubt or whatever it might be. Uh, but Stephanie asks, I know Mormons that say the Bible is true as long as it's interpreted correctly. How do they interpret scripture that actually tells us God's spirit lives within us or that Christ lives in us? It's a great question, Stephanie. They probably say that wasn't tr translated correctly and it was corrupted by men. Um, Telly Galba says, awesome, Sean, you're a blessing right on, brother. This is why I'm no longer I am Mormon. Mary Christensen says, excellent. And finally, there's two more. This is an important one. This is from a, a Latter-day Saint man. He calls in sometimes. He says, I agree. His name's H. Huff 
Humble. I think that's his real name. I agree with you, Sean, somewhat, but not totally. He's LDS. We are both over 50. I stayed LDS. You left. We both have families. We love Christ. We're both former missionaries, etc. That we may always have his spirit to be with us. That's quoting the LDS sacrament prayer, which I cited last night. We disagree on this, not because I think you're wrong, but because you seem to have forgotten the general meaning of our doctrine. And he goes on to clarify that he says, I am a sinner, filthy rags, not saved by works, saved by faith through uh, grace and the blood of Jesus Christ and his life and death and resurrection. And he cites 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now, I got to tell you, brother, that's great. I, 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 I love that and I love that you believe that. But what you're saying there, um, the filthy rags bit, that is not embraced. When a Latter-day Saint teaches, I am a child of God and he has sent me here, he's teaching that he comes from, any, from a heavenly realm to this earth as God's child. The scripture teaches completely different. So when you say that Mormon's general meaning of their doctrine is that they are sinners in filthy rags, that is not the teaching of Mormonism. They elevate the status of man and denigrate the status of God. You got to understand that. And I'm not picking. They elevate the status of man as making them God's children by birth. And they denigrate the status of God by making him not eternal, but in an eternal line of, of gods. And so you have a problem with that statement, even though you're citing 1 Corinthians. And it's not that you might not believe this. I'll give you the benefit of that doubt. But if I go out, he says, he says, I believe we're sinners, filthy rags, and it was saved by faith through grace, uh, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, but if I go out and commit adulterous acts or murder someone or lie and steal, the spirit does withdraw itself because it will not dwell in unholy temples. Okay, I want to stop on that point. Let me tell you something. One, brother, you uh, describe the, tr the things that we could do as adulterous acts, murder, lie, or steal, and the spirit does withdraw itself uh, because it doesn't dwell in unholy temples. Your temple was made holy, not by your righteousness, but by Christ's. And that was imputed to you. Your temple by itself through you is always unholy. You are constantly lying and lusting after all sorts of things, wine, women, and song. That's what our flesh does. Our flesh is always unholy. So therefore, what you're saying is really the Holy Spirit is never with us because we're always unholy. Unless you believe, Brother Humble, that you can get yourself to a place where you think that you're holy and not and without sin, your flesh. And that's what all the, you know, wearing the right clothes and going to the temple and renewing covenants and all that stuff. You think you've gotten yourself there. But I'm going to tell you something. Your heart's corrupt, brother. It's corrupt. No matter what you think, like Martin Luther said, you know, it's really easy to believe that you're, that you're really good around friends, but put yourself in the place of enemies. Like hang around some people who don't like you or some people who disagree with you and see your feeling, what your feelings are toward them. Look at someone who picks on your kid at school or something or cuts you off in traffic. You'll fall from your high horse of, of being worthy to have the Holy Spirit real quick because we're not. And so Jesus is the one by faith on him that we have that Holy Spirit with us, not our works because our works are filthy rags and they will never make you holy. He goes on and says, I get what you're saying, I respect that, but the Holy Spirit will leave someone if they become reprobate or willingly turn away from God. That's a fact. We willingly turn away from God every day. That's what humans do. There is none righteous, no, not one. We don't have in our flesh a desire to serve God. Our flesh says serve self. So it's only Christ in us by faith 
that allows you to have any stance with God because Christ is the one who gave you your righteousness and imputed it to you. So you're, you're on a very Mormon slippery slope and I like it and look at, you wanna believe this and live it? Have fun, do it. You go to God and you, you tell him all you've done to keep the Holy Spirit with you, you know? And he goes on, he says, I'm not a nice guy, I'm a prodigal son, I'm the rebel of the church. When we say the sacrament, we mean in general the word may, meaning the Spirit may be with us, may be with you, but he says, but you do have to live righteously. And I want, I, I want to hear how you're living righteously. I want to hear exactly what that looks like. Because in the end, you're not. And then it's just hypocrisy. Hypocris, hypocris uh, he adds, the Spirit doesn't just hang out in us because Jesus died. He stays with us because he testifies of Christ and gives us truth. But I can't just be born again and go back to the party. Okay. And there you have a kind of a mixture of truth and error. He does stay in you because Jesus died by your faith in him through God's grace. So that is where I think you're off on that. And when Jesus is in you, your new man doesn't want to go back to the party. Your flesh might. And it might go back to the party, but the true you does not want it. And what happens is you go to the party, you come home, you're laying on your bed, the room's spinning, the woman is left, and you're like, oh man, that's not me. I've really blown it. And that spirit in you, when you're at your lowest moments, causes you to change and turn and change your mind about what you've been doing. But there's none of this righteousness staying with not righteous, went and visited the party, abandoning bet. That is the pro one of the major problems with Mormonism. He uh, then says, um, a true Christian changes and grows, true, and may slip, true, but we have to try, but we have to try. And I agree, but what does the trying look like? It looks like dying to self, not trying in the flesh. It means dying to what your will is and surrendering, not doing more good, not dressing up the pig and putting lipstick on it and thinking that it's pretty. It's dying to your will with Christ and the spirit in you, causing you to do it, Mr. Humble. It is not contingent as you write here on your Christian behavior. Uh, so I just wanted to say uh, those things on that. One more comment, and we have an off-air comment from Timothy, but I have this on my phone because I couldn't print it before. And this is from, uh, let me say here, this is from, um, oh. now this is why I don't do this on the show. It's from Ex Mormon for Christ Alone. He says, spot on, love this teaching, Sean. It is no longer about me living a certain way as the scripture states. Now listen to the scripture. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's very contrary to what LDS teach. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is such an appropriate scripture, having just read Huff Humble's comment. It's Galatians 2.20. And then he adds Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, The life we receive in the new covenant is eternal it does not come and go. God lives in and through us by his spirit and we have become a new creation. I thank you so much for that, my brother. And as new creations, you are constantly in that battle between what your flesh wants and what the spirit wants and the spirits with you, helping you fight it and reminding you when your flesh takes over, that's not the way to go. 
That's the Christian way to understand the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of, and, and that's the way to confront the LDS view, which is so, um, it's so off course, and it's so, it's full of bondage, and it's full of fear, and it does not add up when you start to discompare apples to apples. Timothy says, Sean, I've watched you for a while now, and I love what you do. But I say this, Jesus is the law as it is described in Isaiah 2, 3, 4. And all law must be understood in this light. Where's my Bible when I need it? Uh, we have just a few seconds. Let me look up Isaiah 2, 3, 4. I know I should know that by heart, but I can't memorize anything. So let me see here really quick. Isaiah... Two, three, four. It says, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we will walk in his paths. The law will go out of from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they trade for war anymore. And that's how it must be understood in this light. Why not? Sure. Sounds good, Timothy. I don't know. Uh, it sounds good. I don't know how that looks when it talks about beating plowshares and all that stuff. We can try to guess but uh, I don't I don't really know do we have any calls we don't have calls we have less than 15 minutes left uh, so what I want to challenge you to do is um, research your eschatology uh, and you know you can go online we now have by the way do we have that spot on if then okay we uh, Seth has gone to the trouble of, of putting if my kingdom were of this world then my servants would fight on a uh, line he's going to release it one chapter at a time and uh, so you can listen through this just like you can read through it and a very short book but that might help you understand some of the things we're talking about relative to the former age of the church that was of the bride to the age that we're in now of course i want to push again christianity's greatest dilemma by grant hill very important book easy to read and it will just take you through the New Testament and help you understand what this pastor discovered about eschatology and why it plays such an important role in how we, excuse me, do the faith today. What's that? We got a caller. We'll take them if Mags is not overwhelmed in the back. Hold on, we got two. She's clearing the calls. Take a look at this. Don't take a look at this. Talking to Mormons. Check that out. Check out the description below on Talking to Mormons. And uh, while you're at it, check out uh, Bishop Earl's uh, Ex-Mormon Files. And while you're at it, check out Check My Church. It's a unique concept that's going on here in the Intermountain West. Um, xmormonfiles.com the links below he's going to start putting things up one i don't have my screen working so tell us who you are <laughs> hi sean charlie west valley charlie what's up <laughs> hey brother good to good to hear your voice hey hey listen there's something you said that kind of kind of bothered me when the, the lady asked you if you uh, uh hadn't stumbled onto uh preterism if you would have had a different view. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I think you being a seeker of truth and having half the questions that we, as uh, seekers of truth, you know, we have a lot of questions in the Bible. We start we start to question some of the, the uh, statements in the Bible, such as, you know, Matthew 24 and Matthew 16 of this generation. Yeah. Uh, I think you would have, because I certainly went to uh, a Baptist church for 10 years, and um, they were futurists, 
and I asked a lot of questions, and the more questions I started to ask, the more, uh, let's, let's say, um, ousting came about, <laughs> and don't question this and don't question that so much, just go along with the crowd. Oh, yeah. And that's what, and so I started to do a lot more research, of course, at the same time uh, you were doing a lot of learning and, so what were you thinking, Charlie? What I said in response to that question, what bothered you? I, I want to know that. Let's address it. Well, the fact is that, that you said that you probably would still be a futurist, that you would still probably be, uh, uh, you know, think that Jesus is coming back and that we should, we should gather everybody and walk more righteously and, 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 and stick to the word and be a... a um, uh, um, you know, follow every commandment that Jesus gave us, and yeah, and, and I would. You start, but, but, to see, you start to read that, you realize. I mean, I started to realize that you know, once I realized that these are letters written to that audience at that time, right? And but, to, but Charlie, remember the premise. The premise of the question was, if I hadn't. If I had not become a preterist, or if I right. if I left it, what would I be today? And and okay. I, I, I and reading the Bible today, if I would and if I wasn't a preterist, meaning I didn't think he had come back, then reading the Bible today, I would say we need to be prepared for his return. And so I would be okay. much more legalistic. I'm not proposing that. I'm just saying if. I would be much more because I don't see any any reason why the letters in the New Testament would um, be altered at all if he hasn't come back yet to take his bride. Okay, that's right. what I meant. You're absolutely right. You're right. If he hadn't come back, or if he hasn't come back to take his bride, we we certainly are in a lot of trouble. I yeah, we are um, real. I mean, <laughs> no one's doing it. I, I don't, I mean, except maybe some really radical, legalistic Amish person or something. Yeah, right? The yeah. Amish, maybe we should start taking more, uh, see how they're living. But I don't think they can do it all either. I, mean, I don't either. Issues, but, I, I don't either. I but, think you're right. Uh, but on the, on the other side of that, I, I, I kind of feel, you know, the mainstream Christianity, I, I, I shake my head. I, you know, I only have. I have a ninth grade education, and uh, uh, I, I, I read the Bible, and I read it subjectively with the Spirit, and I, I can't help but see, other than the fact that people, they run scared that they're going to lose control of, of, I'm not sure of what, uh, of their congregations or, 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 or just control of, of what what they've what they've created they're afraid to uh, lose that control but it's so obvious how can it how can they not see that christ had it had a bride and and i love what you said the other night christ took his bride and we become the children of that bride yeah um and that that was spot on and i just don't understand myself I shake my head in awe that and um, that they just don't want to let go, or if they're just scared to let go. I don't know that notion. I don't. Same yeah. same question for the Jews in Jesus' day. <laughs> right. What what were they clinging to? I don't know. What are they clinging to? <laughs> Charlie, great All talking right, with you, brother. Good, good talking to you, my brother. Thanks for calling. You bet. We'll... Okay. Bye bye. Hey, uh, before we go to Timothy, really quickly, John O'Reardon, uh, he wrote, you're breaking up to bits. Great job. Please explain how you never trust your heart. I don't go to church, only listen to people like you. Will I end up in heaven? Uh, first of all, I think everyone's going to end up in heaven as hell's been abolished. Christ has had the victory. Will you end up in the kingdom of God? Do you believe on Jesus? Uh, John, do you, do you put your faith and trust in him? And are you walking in love, trying to walk in love? The best 
in your faith as you grow, etc. But do you believe and place your faith on Jesus? That will determine if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of God on high, the new Jerusalem. Uh, uh, so that's my answer to your brother. And you don't have to go to any church uh, or listen to anybody like me. You can, uh, you can be it out there in the wilderness without a Bible and you can uh, enter into that kingdom. It's all by the Spirit. It's all by God calling. It's all by you walking. Everything else is a gift or a detraction. So keep going, man. And let's finally go to Timothy on line three. Timothy, you're on Heart of the Matter. Timothy. Timothy? Titus? Philemon? Little scriptural joke for you. We lost Timothy. All right, guys, join us next week as we're going to continue on talking on Monday night about the Holy Spirit and Mormonism and write your comments below as you think of them. And we will see you here on Heart of the Matter.